Hey guys, so this week we are talking lipids. It's gonna be awesome. There's a lot going on here. We're also gonna talk about membranes a lot since they're so intrinsically tied together, uh, i.e. phospholipid bilayers, so let's get into it. So what is a lipid? Generally we define lipids, um, <laughs> usually we say like to the layperson, which if you start Googling this stuff or do Google images, you're going to get all these crazy nutritional things and it just gets, um, complicated uh, by the uh, non-scientific community. Uh, but a lipid is really just a biomolecule that is soluble in a non-polar solvent, okay? So, i.e. not water. So they're generally hydrophobic, or at least have a hydro hydrophobic region. Uh, now, of course, uh, when you think lipids, basically what you're thinking of are fats. And so, I mean, that's foods, uh, they have different, you know, abilities and stuff, and we're gonna talk about mostly this stuff here. Uh, but they do have a lot of functionalities uh, in like uh, larger scale things like medicines and things. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, we all know what fats are and stuff like oils and fats. And so uh, we're going to talk about those today. So there are three main types of lipids uh, that we're going to talk about. Uh, so there are triglycerides and in general, that's our energy storage molecule. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about phospholipids uh, in, for cell membranes. Um, just that general structure. We're going to talk about that. There's a ton of variety in there. And then we'll talk a little bit about sterols, um, which are like your cholesterols uh, or your ergosterols. Uh, and those are in cell membranes, but they're also part of signaling molecules. And it's going to get a little um, uh, complicated might be the wrong term, but there's just going to be a lot because a lot of these things are uh, tied to each other. And there's a lot of uh, pathways that cross over. And so uh, I'll try and keep things pretty clear, uh, but uh, let's get into it. Now, in general, these are our structures that we're dealing with. And why am I showing you this? Because I want you to see the consistencies. So uh, one of the keys to learning uh, fats and lipids and their structures is to look for the consistencies, okay? I say this as somebody who uh, struggled with this. So. Uh, here we've got our three groups again, our triglycerides, our phospholipids, and our steroids, okay? So in general, most of the time, uh, uh, cursory examinations of lipids um, will generally just have these three groups. And I want you to see these nice long fatty acid chains. So these are long carbon hydrogen chains, okay? And fatty acids, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about these in a minute, and fatty acids comprise most of your triglycerides and a huge portion of your phospholipids. Okay, and so once we understand a lot about fatty acids, then we can understand a little bit better about triglycerides and phospholipids, hence why we're going to spend a lot of time talking about fatty acids. All right, so just to reiterate, uh, here's another, <laughs> so basically I'm going to slowly expose you to the massive amounts of lipids that exist on this planet. Uh, it can be super overwhelming, uh, especially if you're trying to teach people about it. So let's try and break this down a little bit. I mean, lipids, I mean, uh, everything is encompassed under lipids. Uh, things with fatty acids in them, so I just mentioned this, okay? So basically, we're all of these things down here, we're going to encompass in our phospholipids or our sphingolipids, but we're going to kind of just lump those together in all the things associated with the cell membrane, okay? Uh, now, there are uh, other things associated with the cell membrane, of course, but these are going to be the big components, okay? Um, now, triacylglycerols up here, so there's your energy, okay? Now, all of these things can be used energetically, and that's where it gets a little confusing, but what's their primary function is what you have to think about. And the primary function of triacylglycerols or, you know, your, your triglycerides is energy, energy storage, okay? Uh, now, you do also have some weird ones, your uh, isoprenoids, <laughs> I think I say that right. Um, generally, those are gonna be your signaling molecules, though they can have other functions as well. Um, I mean, <laughs> that's your steroids, uh, your hormones. Um, you can have lipid-based vitamins like vitamin D. Uh, I think vitamin A is as well. Terpenes, that's like in plants. Um, they'll be like plant defensive molecules. Uh, I mean, if it's insoluble in water, that's like so many things. And so you can see why it's so many things. So let's kind of break it down and try and just dig a little bit deeper into uh, the specifics and just make it a little simpler need to talk about fatty acids, okay? And uh, to get us into fatty acids, we're gonna focus on this first structure, our triglycerides, and there's those fatty acids right there. So triglycerides are uh, generally a long-term energy storage molecule, okay? Uh, they can have a huge variety, and that variety typically just comes from the length of the fatty acids themselves, 
Okay, so here is your typical fatty acid, long carbon chain. This one is a fully hydrogenated, so this would uh, be called a saturated fatty acid. Okay, uh, these are actually all saturated fatty acids. We're going to talk about what that means. And what you're going to do is you're going to take a glycerol molecule, which is a water soluble alcohol, okay, lots of alcohol groups, and you're going to uh, have a condensation reaction, which is a dehydration reaction, hence you get water out, uh, with uh, one, two, or three fatty acids. Now, in general, we refer to three of them, okay? It's a triglyceride. It's also called a triester. Uh, that would be a more generic term for it because there are three ester bonds, okay? So uh, we've got our ester bonding here. We've got our carbon with a carboxylic acid, uh, and then we've got another carbon chain going this way, and then an oxygen, and then another carbon chain. And so that's an ester. And so you have three ester bonds, hence triester. <laughs> Uh, triglyceride, meaning that we have our glycerol group with three fatty acids sticking off of it. Uh, important to note, uh, your fatty acid will always have a carboxylic acid on one end and a methyl group uh, terminating it on the other end. Now, yes, it's a bunch of carbons, okay, but at the very end, it's technically a methyl group. And so that's your typical fatty acid. Uh, length obviously can change. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about structure in a second. Uh, and the presence of um, da, uh, bonds, double bonds. Sorry, I was going to say di bonds. What? Uh, now, if you want to go backwards, which of course you can go backwards, if you need to um, build these, then you need to break them down too, right? So if you're going to get the energy back out. And that's hydrolysis, or it's also oxidation. Uh, oxidation is generally what we call it when we're breaking things down, right? We're pulling electrons away. Okay, so we're, we're oxidized. Uh, we're oxidizing a compound and then reducing another compound, okay? And so if we're making it, that's condensation, dehydration. I guess you could say a reduction as well. Uh, an esterification, right? Because we're forming an ester. But in for the most part, we usually call these condensation reactions. If we're going the other way, it's an oxidation. It's a hydrolysis because we're going to use water because that's generally what our solute, um, our solute, is, not our solute, our solvent, sorry. Um, even though obviously these are uh, insoluble in water. Uh, but there are a couple other terms I just want to hit. Um, rancidification, so that's when you have spontaneous oxidation of your bonds. And so that's when, um, like if you leave, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, like if you leave um, butter sitting out and it starts to stink, uh, it's gone rancid, right? And that's actually a technical term, uh, I guess arguably technical, aren't, they, aren't these all technical terms? Uh, for a uh, oxidation reaction, right? Hydro spontaneous oxidation or partial oxidation of these fatty acids, so you kind of like lose one of these or two of these, and fatty acids can have really complex structures. Um, I, let me rephrase that. Uh, they can have really long, twisty structures. Sometimes they can be complex. I guess it depends on how you define complexity. But um, and some of those molecules that fall off can smell bad. <laughs> so yeah, and then we're going to talk about saponification in a second. Uh, that's how we make soap. Uh, which seemed kind of cool, so I thought we should talk about that. Now, to actually uh, metabolize, so either, uh, in, this one's talking about how to make it, uh, but to break it down would be similar, like reverse pathways. But basically, if you're going to generate um, triglycerides, or monoglycerides in this case, uh, the actual pathways are really, really similar. So we're going to see a lot of these consistent between gl either glycolysis, okay, so uh, there's pyruvate, which would come from a glycolysis, uh, you could argue that acetyl-CoA could come out of glycolysis. It's sort of the intermediate step between glycolysis and citric acid cycle. And then uh, a lot of these, so there's acetyl-CoA again, and then uh, oxaloacetate and citric acid, uh, these uh, come from the citric acid cycle themselves. They're intermediates. And so something important as we actually start digging into these deeper pathways, i.e. glycolysis or citric acid cycle, uh, we're going to follow those cycles. So like we'll, we'll learn all the steps of the citric acid cycle. But you can pull intermediates of the citric acid cycle out of that cycle and use them to do other things. And that's a really important idea to understand. But it's pretty straightforward, honestly. You're gonna take your glycerol here, there's your glycerol, and we're gonna mash it together with a fatty acid. So they're implying that you have to have at least three carbons, but whatever. Um, and then you're gonna go down, you can have less than three, uh, but you're going to then uh, perform an esterification and generate uh, in this case, a monoglyceride, but then you've got these two nice open groups. Now, they're showing it this way because you could actually generate a phospholipid this way by only having one fatty acid or maybe just two fatty acid chains and leaving the other one open to bond with other things. So that's 
why this picture itself is called uh, just showing monoglycerides. So let's talk a little bit about fatty acids. So big, long carbon chains, pretty straightforward structure, honestly. I mean, you have your carboxylic acid on the end here and just a bunch of carbons, um, but how, you could do other stuff, like you could have a double bond in there, you could have a couple double bonds, and so let's talk a little bit about that. So saturation is probably something that you've heard of. Um, hydrogenation, or like partially hydrogenated soybean oil, or um, saturated fats versus unsaturated fats. Um, those are all just different versions of fatty acids, and so it's always referring to this fatty acid chain, which of course you can have your uh, triglycerides, which are made of fatty acid chains, and so uh, you can have a variety of fatty acids in your triglycerides. And so when we say saturated, that just means that all your carbons are full up with hydrogens, okay? Now, to actually do that, we, we use a process called hydrogenation. Uh, and I'm going to have a little video in a second that talks a little bit about that, uh, as well as a slide. Uh, unsaturated is when you get double bonds. And so naturally occurring double bonds, uh, well, double bonds can exist either in a cis configuration or a trans configuration. So are they on the same side? Uh, of the are the hydrogens on the same side or are they on opposite sides? So cis versus trans. So in this case, this would be a cis version versus a trans version of a fatty acid. Now, uh, in general, um, not in general, uh, <laughs> trans fats. Okay, so trans fats down here. Uh, those are unnatural. Those are man-made fats. Now you can eat them and you can break them down. However, cis fats are generally what um, get created in living systems okay now you can you can get some trans fats in like certain animal fats that occur naturally but for the most part cis fats are what occur naturally uh it, as a nice generalization i'm going to say that like so many times uh enzymes for all kinds of creatures tend to like cis fats better hence why trans fats last longer on the shelf so they have extended shelf life uh, now, the chain length is important, so there are really five classifications. Um, some, some people don't include very long ones, but you might as well. Uh, so they can be short, which is five or less. Um, you could have medium and long chain ones. Those are generally most of your fatty acids are going to be uh, typically medium uh, uh, to long. Uh, so are, are the ones that we encounter most of the time. You can have very long, but those are uh, much more rare as our short ones, but the medium to longs are when most of these actually fall in there. Uh, now, one important idea too, if you have this saturated, okay, it's a lot easier to fit a bunch of them close together. And so you can really squish them and stack them. And in general, fats that are comprised of saturated fatty acids are solid at room temperature, okay, as opposed to unsaturated fats, which tend to be liquid at room temperature. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're healthier either which way. It just has to do with their saturation levels. And it, I mean, it depends on what you mean by room temperature. I mean, if it's really hot, then uh, like I remember we had um, coconut uh, like cooking oil fat stuff and it would be solid in the wintertime. And then in <laughs> like summertime, apparently our house got warmer and it, it was like right at room temperature and it would uh, turn into a liquid. So I wanted to show a little video from uh, the osmosis people. I forget what they're called, like osmosis.org. Uh, and they're just going to quickly talk a little bit about, uh, they're just going to show you some uh, visuals that talk about this and the process of hydrogenation. Now, looking at the double bond of this unsaturated fatty acid, like most unsaturated fats, it's got a cis configuration. In a cis configuration, the two functional groups are on the same side of the double bonded carbons. Now, when this happens, the fatty acid chain naturally bends. A molecule that bends does not pack tightly together, so it's a lot more fluid. Think about cooking oils, which are liquid at room temperature. Some fats are in a trans configuration, though. In a trans configuration, the functional groups are on opposite sides of the double bonded carbons. And this keeps the chain more straight and easier to pack. Trans fats result from a process called partial hydrogenation. In just plain old hydrogenation, hydrogens are added to cis fats to get rid of all of the double bonds. So let's say that you've got this triglyceride, and it has a total of two double bonds. So in this case, we'd add four hydrogens, two for each double bond. That turns the unsaturated fatty acids with cis double bonds into saturated fatty acids. 
Partial hydrogenation, on the other hand, refers to adding hydrogens to most, but not all, double bonds. So let's say now that we add just two hydrogens. When this happens, some double bonds can be turned into single bonds by the hydrogens, but then they might reform. And what you end up with is an unsaturated fat, but some of those fats have trans double bonds. Partial hydrogenation is a process that happens naturally in the digestive tract of some animals, like cows and pigs, which is why trans fats can be found naturally in meat and dairy products. Trans fats are also created through the partial hydrogenation of liquid oils, a process that makes them solid. Partially hydrogenated oils have been largely removed from foods in North America and Europe because trans fats have been associated with coronary heart disease. Video, I like their videos a lot. Uh, we're actually going to watch uh, part of the rest of that video later. So saturated versus unsaturated fats. Um, here are just some examples. Uh, you might see some of these. There's palmitic acid that's like from palm oil, which is a saturated fat. Um, uh, so uh, the unsaturated ones tend to exist more in, uh, those are what we would consider healthier fats. Uh, they're generally easier to cut because that double bond sort of exposes that carbon chain. Uh, to enzymes, and so they're a little easier to break. Now, uh, is that good? Is that bad? It doesn't necessarily matter, uh, but you can just have a, a large variety, which is really, really interesting. Um, we generally categorize them by a uh, carbon length, uh, and I forgot to mention that earlier. So if you ever needed to actually uh, say, oh, the it's reacting with the number six carbon or whatever, you always count from the carboxylic acid end, and so that's the first carbon, and then you go out. Uh, but there are some other alternative uh, numbering schedules or naming schedules for the, the carbons. Um, I'm not including one of them because it's really complicated. Uh, but if you uh, skip that first carbon, then the number two carbon would be the alpha and then the beta and then the gamma and so on. Uh, if you want to use Greek letters. Uh, usually that is just referring to um, eventually you could say like, oh, it's a, a gamma double bond at the sixth carbon or whatever. So that's where that comes from. Now, you can have multiple double bonds in your fatty acid chain, and we call those polyunsaturated, okay? So we can have saturated, you can't have polysaturated, that doesn't make sense, uh, but you can have either monounsaturated or polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids. And uh, yeah, they're just very on carbons. Now, I wanted you to see this chart. I know the quality isn't great, but uh, notice uh, 12 carbons, 14 carbons, 16 carbons, 18 carbons. Uh, in general, we tend to see more of the even-numbered carbon chains than the odd numbers. You can have odd numbers, uh, especially 13, 15, and 17 as odd numbers. Uh, but a lot of times they're actually even-numbered for a variety of reasons. Now, uh, I just wanted to show you this. So here's an example of these are all 18 carbon chains, and they all have different names. And uh, it all just depends on where that double bond is. So if you're saturated, it's stearic acid, okay? Uh, it's found in animal fats. You can make it artificially using hydrogenation. Now, you have, can have oleic acid, which is also a really common one. So most of your olive oil is actually in uh, made of oleic acid, which is really, really cool. Um, but if you do a partial hydrogenation of maybe like a double cis or a polyunsaturated fat that has 18 carbons, and you end up with maybe one trans uh, double bond here, we call that, <laughs> I'm not going to say that right, elaid. Dick. Elaidic acid? <laughs> I don't remember. Um, <laughs> but that's one that can show up because it's it's artificially made, right? It's it's a trans fat because most of the time your trans fats are artificial. And there you've got it from partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. So you could take a, a poly unsaturated, so multiple double bonds, and if you end up with a double bond here that's trans, uh, that's what we call that, elaidic acid. It's a trans unsaturated fatty acid. Uh, so that's important. So that's where you get either hydrogenated soybean oil or partially hydrogenated soybean oil. That's where that's coming from. And this is much harder for enzymes to cleave than like a cis one. And so it lasts longer. Last couple things I wanted to hit uh, a couple of, uh, you could call them industrial processes. Uh, saponification, that's making soap. So that's just what we call it. Uh, you're going to take some kind of uh, triglyceride, uh, it doesn't have to be all the same length. So that's just common to, if you're just talking about triglycerides in general, to just have them all the same length. But there's nothing that says they have to be all the same length. Um, but uh, when you saponify, you use heat plus a really strong base. So uh, often we'll say sodium hydroxide. 
uh, and then you will uh, be able to uh, just cleave this off, um, de-esterify. Uh, we call it saponification, uh, but you're uh, going to end up with uh, these soap molecules. So this is, uh, it's a salt of fatty acid. So it's fatty acid plus this salt because you have this nice negative charge and then the sodium's got to balance it out. Um, and then, so this can then go on to form like micelles or um, uh, basically act as the functionality of soap, which is a, sort of a single phospholipid layer. It's not a bilayer, but it's like a single layer. Uh, now, that uh, is also going to generate glycerin, or you're going to regenerate your glycerol, basically. Uh, and this is how you make glycerol, which is a really, really common chemical that's used for all kinds of processes. Um, glycerin, glycerol, same thing. Um, and so, yeah, this is the, I think, the number one way to actually make glycerin, too. Now, I included the next slide, just, <laughs> you got to have a fatty acid to do it. So, like, I don't know, I just thought this was funny. I, Yes, uh, because you gotta have a, there's your triglyceride, uh, or your triacyl glyceride, sure, fine, whatever, same difference. Uh, and then you're generating your glycerol, but you can't saponify every kind of lipid. I guess that's the whole point of this. It came from like a textbook. Um, <laughs> I mean, if it's a goofy looking sterol or whatever, like, or a tocopherol that's like got all this crazy stuff on it, but yeah, you, you can't get it to react. So I don't know, it seems pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, another really common fatty acid slash fat just associated thing is how we actually hydrogenate things. Now, the process of hydrogenation doesn't just have to be for fats, it could be anything. So long, any kind of long chain carbon molecule that has like a double bond in it, then you can add hydrogens to it, of course. Uh, now you need to apply uh, heat usually, uh, and you need to supply extra hydrogen, okay? So hence, uh, this is just the process how you would typically use a, a nickel-based uh, catalyst. Um, so you would throw the catalyst in and then you add hydrogen gas, of course, so this is super dangerous uh, because you have gasoline or some kind of fuel with hydrogen gas, which is incredibly flammable, as well as a nickel catalyst. Things are happening, it's really dangerous, but hey, you gotta make some food, you gotta make your trans fats, uh, or you gotta make your partially hydrogenated soybean oil, so that people can eat it because people like to pay for food and uh, I mean that sounds like I'm judging that I like to eat too so um, you often will use a nickel based catalyst for this uh, why well uh, the catalyst is actually uh, this blue block here and then it lets you um, so the nickel will hold on to the double bond as well as the hydrogens and then it's just bringing everything together it's just like how enzymes sort of bring things together and let them happen, well, that's what they're doing here. They're bringing the double bonded carbon with the hydrogens close together and allowing the reaction to occur, which is kind of cool. So we're gonna start moving on into the cell membrane. So uh, I'm gonna try and keep it relatively organized, as, uh, but there's gonna be, uh, it's gonna get a little chaotic when we start talking about sterols because uh, we do see uh, our phospholipids and our, our other lipids that have a charged head and a fatty acid tail uh, yes, those make up our membranes. Uh, that's basically their job. Uh, but we also do see a lot of sterols, like cholesterol, in the membranes, but there are other sterols that are used for other things. And so uh, we'll try and stay organized here. Um, so if we're going to store stuff, there's your triacylglycerols, there's your, um, your triglycerides, your triglycerides over here. Now, our membrane lipids kind of fall into two big categories. You got your glycolipids, so that's where you're going to throw on a sugar. Uh, so we talked about that last time, where you have some kind of saccharide, either a mono or oligosaccharide. Uh, I guess suppose it could be a polysaccharide, but you'd probably call it an oligosaccharide. Uh, or you can tack on some kind of phosphate, either with an alcohol or choline, uh, and those can either fall under, uh, <laughs> they can either have a glycerol, just like uh, triacylglycerols do, or you can have a sphingosine, uh, but basically you just have a, another carbon-based structure with a fatty acid. Uh, so you have a nice charge area, so this is kind of where the charge comes from, and then you have those fatty acids that stick down. And so this is a classic uh, look <laughs> of what it looks like. What? Um, and so you have your nice charged head. So instead of just being completely hydrophobic, like our fatty acids are, then we can have a nice hydrophilic region. Now that hydrophilic region does not have to have a phosphate, okay? Uh, a lot of times they do. Uh, we generally say phospholipid bilayer because, I don't know, that's just what a lot of them are. They don't have to be, of course not. Uh, it's biology or biochemistry, so like of course there's exceptions always. But notice you also, you have that glycerol and you have your fatty acids, so it's really not that different, 
from a triglyceride, except you have this other little head group here. Uh, but generally, you just have those two sides, right? A hydrophobic and a hydrophilic region. Now, you can get some variety in there. Uh, there is so much information out there about the different kinds of phospholipids that you can generate or just the, the different kind of cell membrane lipids. There's huge charts. There's entire research groups whose job is to do this. And so uh, you can just find all kinds of different things. Uh, but basically, you're going to have a charged region uh, with some kind of long chain. And uh, something I want to keep in your brains is, oh, man, I swear, I have like better quality pictures. Um, when you have a nice long straight chain like this, you can stack them really tight, okay? But that might not necessarily be what you want because you're going to get a lot of hydrophobic interactions between each phospholipid. And that can really kind of stifle things. It can hold things a little too tight. So sometimes you actually want some kinks in there. And so that's where you're going to add in your double bonds. So you can get some cis fatty acids going, and then that uh, gives him a little kink, so it looks like he's like, like walking. But that's going to put some extra space in between the nearby phospholipids. And so that can really kind of open up your lipid bilayer. So here's just a classic image of what our lipid bilayer looks like, okay? And you can see you're going to want some kinks in there, okay? That's really, really important. Um, and what are these? Oh, what are those? Those look like sterols to me. Interesting. Well, we should probably talk about those. Uh, but phospholipids and general uh, membrane lipids form naturally form these kinds of sheets. Uh, so you can have a monolayer sheets, of course, that's like what soap kind of forms, but you can also have these bilayers where your hydrophobic regions line up and then your hydrophilic regions line up on the outside where there's actual water uh, because we're basically always dealing in uh, water as our solvent. Uh, as opposed to, uh, in some industrial processes, I mean, water might not be your solvent, but hey, it's biochemistry, not chemistry. Um, just to show, like, the size of these, 0.126 nanometers. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, it's just kind of interesting, I thought. Uh, but this is where we're at. We're inside a cell. We're looking at it. We're trying to see what's going on. Now, this is interesting. So, what we actually learn is that phospholipid bilayers are not just made of phospholipids. They're made of all kinds of crazy lipids that have charged heads, as well as sterols. So we need to talk about sterols, which comes from steroid, hence ster, and then alcohol, so all, so steroid alcohols. Okay, so there's your alcohol right there, and this is your steroid. And then there's your alcohol, and there's the rest of your steroid structure. Now, uh, they have this consistent four ring structure. Okay. Uh, this is a subgroup. Um, so steroids don't all have to be sterols. Okay. So it's like not a, um, all sterols are steroids. They're steroid alcohols, but not all steroids are sterols. <laughs> That's why, why am I even talking about this? Um, it's a subgroup of steroids. Oh man, I'm getting myself mixed up because this is <laughs> this ring structure. Oh my gosh. This ring structure is the steroid portion. <laughs> if they're in plants, they're phytosterols, because plants. And then if they're animals, they're zo... I would say zoosterols, but you could probably say zoosterols or zoosterols, whatever. It's fine. They increase fluidity, and we need to talk about that a little bit. Um, we're going to get into that in uh, a little bit. Uh, we're actually going to wait a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking ahead and realizing that I want to talk about some other stuff, like where we actually make these. Um, but they're in the cell membranes and they're precursors as well. So it's not just for cell membranes, though that's, they're super duper important. Um, arguably just as important as your phospholipids or your sterols. Um, but uh, they're also really important for steroid hormones, bile acids, uh, and some vitamins. Not all vitamins, but some vitamins. A little bit about where they come from. The main pathway is the mevalinate pathway, mevalinate pathway, however you want to say it. Um, and you have all these precursor molecules, okay? So we've got these uh, long chain carbons, and we just are gonna basically combine a bunch of small carbon chains to build these nice ring structures. So it's organic chemistry, basically, uh, but I mean, you could argue it's biochemistry, but you're, uh, it's a classic, I, this makes me think of uh, doing like organic chemistry lab. And when you would have to do, you know, like each reaction and then build a bigger molecule and then you combine those and you get them to fold over and eventually you can get some of them to come out like this. Now, squalene is a really common molecule. Uh, it's used uh, a lot of time in like all kinds of processes. It came up when I was in grad school. 
uh, in vaccines. Um, it just, it's really, really common. Uh, and it's common in like every organism ever. And you make squalene. If you're a plant, if you're an animal, a fish, I know sharks have a bunch of squalene in them. And <laughs> you can get that to fold over. You're basically like folding this onto this and this onto this and this onto this. And you can form that sterile basic structure. So you got that nice steroid in here. And then you add like an alcohol group onto various spots to actually generate your actual sterols. Um, and so plant steroids start with squalene, as do animals. Um, but animals have a lanosterol and plants use cycloartinol. Fun fact. Now, why am I showing you that? Well, it becomes medically relevant. So I wanted you to see mevalinate. So mevalinate, there's mevalinate. So this is the mevalinate pathway because you end up with, um, uh, you start with mevalinate and then you end up going down and you end up all these, there's a couple of different pathways and how to actually build these crazy looking things. And look, it, the whole point here, there's a lot going on. Okay. I understand that. You're ending up with cholesterol. Everybody's heard of cholesterol, right? What's your level of cholesterol? What's your LDL? What's your HDL? Um, most of you watching this are probably younger, so you may have never had a cholesterol uh, examination or level check. Uh, I have mine in two weeks uh, because I'm in my mid-30s and that's something they like to look at. So mine's always pretty good. Uh, but they're going to measure your LDL, your, your low-density lip uh, um, low lipids, your high-density lipids, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, but basically, I just want to show you, um, it, you can ask your dad or maybe your grandpa, I have no idea how old you are, uh, if they're on a statin. So my dad is on statins. So statin drugs drop your cholesterol. Uh, now, there's some debate about how important your cholesterol levels are actually are to your health. Um, so, but arguably, you could say, I mean, if you have high cholesterol levels in your blood, that is going to technically allow for the formation of more like bad things, basically plaque formation uh, in your vessel walls along the endotheliums. And so uh, generally you want to keep it lower. Now it turns out there's, that's an oversimplification, but hey, whatever. So if you want to drop your cholesterol levels because it's, I don't know, the mid nineties and they think that's the most important thing in the world, instead of diet, they can just put you on a statin drug or one of these other drugs that are going to block these specific pathways. And, they're all just these pathways that lead to cholesterol. But look at, if you take a statin drug, that's blocking it really early on. And that's why statins are really, really common. Now they do have some other problems though, not that we need to get into statin drug metabolisms and side effects, uh, but there are a lot of side effects to statins. Um, my dad always had uh, joint issues when he was on statins. So let's keep on going. So Talking sterols, steroids. So your sterols can be nice precursors for a lot of things. So cholesterol being one of them. Cholesterol is basically one of those things that you're going to use a lot in your cell membranes. But that's not the only function for sterols or steroid-based uh, molecules. Uh, a lot of them are signaling molecules. Um, your progesterones, your androgens, um, uh, your estrogens. Uh, I don't think... I'm looking on here. I don't think testosterone is one of these. Oh, no, there it is. Yes, testosterone is. So uh, we've heard of all of those things, right? Your estrogens, your testosterones, uh, all your sex um, steroids uh, that are sending cell signals, right? And so uh, the, the colors here just kind of indicate like where they are, like what kind of compartment they are, or what, um, what kind of, like, is it a prostaglandin? And then it's in the yellow. Uh, it, does it kind of bridge the gap between those? Um, and is, where is it made? Is it made in the mitochondria? Is it made in the ER? Uh, it all depends on the cells and what kind of cells they actually are, but it's really, really interesting. Um, and notice uh, uh, the carbon amounts. Hey, you got actually odd numbers of carbons here. Interesting. Uh, anyway, so really, really cool stuff. We call that steroidogenesis, uh, but you can start with cholesterol to actually build all of these. So this is really important. This is why uh, you need to actually consume fats. Fats are really, really important because we can break fats down into these precursors and then build them back into sterols, okay? Uh, among other things, like you can get these precursors from pretty much uh, anything that you eat, but fats, it's easier. And so you can get those things to make these cholesterols in order to make these hormones to actually make your body do stuff. So that's really interesting. That's why this stuff is actually important. So speaking of important things, uh, vitamin D is something that we need to talk about. So this is kind of the, the quintessential vitamin that we talk about when we talk about sterols and steroids. And when you get uh, UV light, now you can eat 
vitamin D and consume it from your foods, but you can also generate it from uh, UV lights. So you can take a, your precursor of it, uh, it's a cholesterol, a dehyd 7 dehydrocholesterol, so it's lost a water molecule, and you can uh, have uh, sunlight actually, you're basically breaking this bond right here, uh, part of that ring structure, and opening it up. And that lets you just kind of do some things to it and then store it long term inside the liver. And so you have that nice vitamin D pool and we can use vitamin D uh, in part of our um, stimulation and inhibitory pathways for controlling calcium and phosphate levels in the blood. Well, uh, calcium is not just for building bones and phosphate is actually, uh, so like calcium phosphate is one of the main ways that we actually build bone, but it's actually used uh, not just structurally, but also those two molecules, so calcium and phosphate are super important signaling molecules. I mean, we use phosphate for ATP and ADP and, AT and AMP, right? Uh, we use phosphates all the time for all your DNA backbones, your RNA backgrounds. Um, uh, you phosphorylate things all the time, so you need lots of phosphate in your blood. And you also need a ton of calcium, especially for muscles, uh, to have them do things. And you need uh, to have neurons. Uh, uh, your neurons need calcium all the time. And so you need to maintain your blood calcium levels at a, a, a very, pretty narrow range as far as molecules go. And so uh, to maintain that range, we have hormones. Uh, parathyroid hormone being one of the main ones. Uh, that can then drive either... Uh, so let's say your calcium levels start dropping. Well, then your parathyroid hormone goes up. It gets secreted by your parathyroid, duh. And then it goes to your kidneys and causes your kidneys to uh, not excrete calcium. Okay, so they kind of hold on to it. Uh, they do get rid of some phosphorus, uh, but in this case, we're dealing with calcium. And then uh, you are going to also, uh, you don't want to get rid of calcium, okay? So you want it to stay in your blood and you want to be absorbing as much as you can. And so your small intestine begins, uh, it's able to better absorb calcium as well as phosphate. Oh, really interesting stuff. Uh, so you can kind of read all about that. Um, yeah, I like both these charts. They're pretty cool. No, I'm basically reading it this way. Fucking sterols and cholesterol. I wanted to briefly talk about this, but I mean, we've got to talk about your liver and your fatty acids, and we've got to talk a little bit more about your LDL and your HDL and all that good stuff, uh, because a lot of people take this class actually want to be doctors, so we should probably talk about it. So here we've got FA, fatty acids, and where they're going to go. Okay, so basically we're going to follow these over here, and we're going to uh, generate some low-density lipoprotein, or uh, lipo, um, low-density lipoprotein. Sorry, I, I had a brain fart. Uh, so, uh, but there's a lot of variety going on here, and it's really, uh, imagine if you have, uh, the way that I help uh, understand my brain, what? Uh, the way I can get my brain to understand this better is to think about if I had like a high-fat diet. Okay, so somebody who, uh, all they do is go to McDonald's and they just eat super fatty stuff all the time. So I'm not really worried about caloric intake, I'm interested more in the actual content of the nutrition they're taking in. And the content is a lot of fats and a lot of fatty acids, not as many carbs, though there are always some, not a lot of protein, not a lot of other nutrients, so you're just getting a lot of fats. And what is your body going to do with it? Well, it needs to store it somehow, right? You can't just have fatty acids floating around willy-nilly. So you're going to send it to your liver, because your liver does all kinds of stuff, and uh, it's going to... Do something with it. It needs to store it somehow, and so it's going to start storing it in these uh, these chunks, these big spheres, basically. It's different sizes, but different size spheres of uh, lipoproteins. Okay, so lipoprotein being it's it has protein components, but it's also a bunch of lipids, and that's what we're talking about, lipids, right? And so we're going to take our fatty acids, take those big long carbon chains, and then we're going to store them. And so we need to talk about that. There is more than just LDL and HDL. Okay. Uh, there's very low density lipoproteins, um, there's the chylomicrons, uh, and uh, there's actually a variety. I, I used to talk about this a little bit more, like there's, uh, there's in-betweens of all of these, but basically I just wanted to cover uh, the function of uh, these um, lipoproteins, okay? So you've got your cells, okay? So this is like the rest of your body, so focus on here. So imagine this is a muscle cell or basically any kind of cell in the body, and if they have excess uh, lipoprotein, they're going to make high density lipoproteins, they're going to send it out, and it's going to head into the liver to be processed or whatever. Okay, so it can come from the liver, either in chylomicron form or from adipose tissue, it's just going to come in there. Um, and then your low densities is how you actually send it out to the cell. So there's a nice little pathway there. Now, if you actually want to go store it in a different way, you can make it very low density lipoprotein and then send that out, and that can either form chylomicrons or you can 
get chylomicrons so you can actually eat stuff and that's where the chylomicrons come from and they all just kind of end up in the liver and if you have excess ones you can send it out so uh, if your liver is getting all fat and gross and full of gross stuff your cells don't need it anymore they're sending all this hdl in there and your the rest of your body doesn't want any more chylomicrons they're sort of sick of it and so you say all right let's get rid of it so you can get rid of the excess in your bile and we need to talk about what bile is and what bile salts are too much McDonald's and you need to get rid of all that fat. Okay, all right, fine. Let's head to the liver and we're going to uh, take all that excess cholesterol. Okay, so it doesn't have to be cholesterol per se, but we're going to stick with this. It comes from a different, uh, uh, it can head a couple different directions, okay? Uh, but basically, you're going to end up with these cholic acids. So either deoxycholic acid, DCA, or lithocholic acid, lithocholic acid. Man, some of these terms are so hard to say. Um, uh, but notice you still have that nice ring structure. You still have that steroid structure here. And what you can do is you're going to then take those things and you're going to basically smash them together with some proteins to kind of keep them together. And that's what's going to form your bile acids. And so uh, the DCA and the LCA, that is going to form your bile acids. So I have this other little, little picture here of uh, what a bile acid looks like. And then what you can do is you can either get rid of it that way, uh, send it out through your intestines, you poop it out. Uh, but also, what's really nice is bile acids have, uh, they are um, amphipathic, so they have a, a water-loving side and a hydrophobic side, and you can use them to sort of form almost like soaps uh, or lipid layers, um, and you could take larger chunks of fat and actually use uh, bile acids to kind of grab onto those and sort of deal with them kind of wrap it around there and then you can get rid of large fat chunks or other lipids that you just have access of. So it's really, really nice. Now I would like to cut to a video that sort of talks a little bit more. Uh, it's the rest of the osmosis video that I showed from earlier. It talks a little bit more about uh, fatty acids and lipids and just how these things are actually stored in chylomicrons. It's really, really good. Let's cut to that. Fats have a three carbon backbone called glycerol as well as fatty acid chains. The fatty acid chain is basically a string of carbon and hydrogen atoms. When an OH group from the glycerol molecule binds to a hydrogen from the fatty acid, an H2O or water molecule gets released, and the two molecules link up. If this happens once, the result is a monoglyceride. If it happens twice, it's a diglyceride, and three times makes a triglyceride. Now there are various types of fatty acid chains, and one way to categorize them is by their length. In other words, how many carbons they have. Short chain fatty acids have 2 to 5 carbons, medium chain fatty acids have 6 to 12 carbons, and long chain fatty acids have 13 or more carbons. Fatty acid chains are also categorized by the bonds connecting the carbons in the chain. A single bond is just one bond between the carbon atoms. And when a fatty acid chain has only single bonds, it's called a saturated fatty acid because it has as many hydrogen atoms as possible, or it's saturated with them. Triglycerides with saturated fatty acids are nice and straight, so they pack together really well, and as a result they're usually solid at room temperature. And the longer the saturated fatty acid chain, the more likely it'll be solid at room temperature. Carbons can also have double bonds between them though. And when a fatty acid has one or more double bonds, it's called an unsaturated fatty acid, because it's not saturated with hydrogen atoms. For every double bond, there are two fewer hydrogen atoms. Also, a double bond causes a kink in the molecule, so the triglycerides don't pack together as nicely as saturated fats. As a result, unsaturated fats are usually liquid at room temperature. Unsaturated fatty acids can be further classified according to the number of their double bonds. Monounsaturated fatty acids are unsaturated fatty acids with just one double bond. Polyunsaturated fatty acids have two or more double bonds. Also, they can be classified according to their location as well. Since all these hydrogens can get kind of crazy looking, we'll just take them away for now. So another name for the methyl end is the omega end. And then we can count the number of carbons until the first double bond. Since this one is 3, it would be an omega-3 fatty acid. If the double bond is 6 carbons from the end, it's an omega-6, and if it's 9 carbons from the end, it's called omega-9. Now to make things even easier when looking at these molecules, I'm just going to show the bonds. 
All right, so omega-3s are usually polyunsaturated fatty acids and include alpha-linolenic acid, or ALA, eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA, and docosohexaenoic acid, or DHA. EPA and DHA are marine sources of omega-3s. They're produced by microalgae and end up in the tissues of fish like anchovies, mackerel, salmon, and sardines. ALA is found in plants like flaxseed, walnuts, and canola and soybean oils. Our bodies can convert ALA into EPA and DHA, but it's an inefficient process that yields only small quantities. And that's why dietary recommendations include foods that have EPA and DHA. Omega-6 fatty acids are also usually polyunsaturated and include linoleic acid and arachidonic acid. Linoleic acid is found in oils like safflower, corn, and soybean oils. Arachidonic acid is found in animal sources like fish, meat, and eggs. Our bodies can convert linoleic acid into arachidonic acid, but once again the process is inefficient. Because ALA and linoleic acid can only be obtained in the diet, they're considered essential fatty acids. Omega-9 fatty acids are typically monounsaturated fatty acids. And an example would be oleic acid, and these can be made by the human body. Foods like canola and olive oil, as well as almonds, contain omega-9s. Although some foods might have more of one type of fat than another, the truth is that all foods are made up of a blend of fatty acids. When you eat a food like peanut butter, which has about 75% of its calories from fat, the body goes through a set of steps to digest and absorb the fatty acids. First of all, triglycerides are hydrophobic, so they form large globules of fat, like what you see when you pour oil in water. Enzymes called lipases in the saliva, stomach, and secreted by the pancreas can break down triglycerides into free fatty acids and monoglycerides. But working on the surface of a globule is inefficient, so to speed things up, bile salts produced by the liver break the large fat droplet into smaller droplets which increases the surface area for the lipases to work. Once the triglycerides are broken down into monoglycerides and free fatty acids, these self-assemble into mixed micelles, which have a hydrophobic interior and a hydrophilic or water-loving exterior. The micelles glide through the watery environment of the intestinal lumen and reach the enterocytes in the intestinal wall. When they get to the enterocytes, the micelles release the fatty acids and monoglycerides which diffuse into the enterocyte. Inside the enterocyte, the fatty acids and monoglycerides reassemble into triglycerides, and these get packed into a larger structure called a chylomicron. The chylomicron has lipids and proteins, so it's a lipoprotein. It has an outer membrane with phospholipids and proteins, and a hydrophobic core that has triglycerides, cholesterol, and fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. The chylomicron then leaves the enterocyte, but it's too large to get into the endothelial cells, so instead it enters a nearby lymphatic capillary called a lacteal. From there, the chylomicron floats in the lymph and flows into the thoracic duct, and then gets dumped into the blood, essentially bypassing the portal vein. Once in the blood, the chylomicron releases fatty acids and monoglycerides in peripheral tissues like muscle, which use them for energy, as well as adipose tissue which can store them. After delivering the triglycerides, the chylomicron shrinks in size and eventually gets engulfed by the liver. Video, uh, all their videos are great. I know I say this a lot for the osmosis videos, but uh, just to go to YouTube and look up osmosis, uh, and uh, you can find a bunch of other other stuff. Um, I just realized that this is kind of zoomed in. My bad. Um, so uh, you can find their stuff. It's really good. Uh, especially if you want to go to med school, uh, the rest of that video, I only showed like, about like four minutes of like a eight minute video. Um, and they talk a lot more about the nutritional aspects of this. So anyway, the last thing I wanted to talk about, I have a few slides here about actual membranes and membrane structure. And this is something I like to talk about when I talk about uh, lipids, uh, because they're so intrinsically tied. So the idea of having a phospholipid and a phospholipid bilayer, and they just come up a lot. So we need to talk about that. Uh, and so off of that, we're actually going to talk about the, the function of membranes as well. Now, 
sterols and membranes. So cholesterol is the one that's mainly in humans. Um, other creatures have different kinds of sterols. So uh, ergol sterol and funguses, plants have a bunch of different sterols. Uh, bacteria have hopinoids, which basically save the exact same purpose. Uh, in most cells, your phospholipid to cholesterol ratio is actually one to one. So we teach you guys about phospholipids being like, oh, it's a phospholipid bilayer. Well, actually, it's arguably just as much cholesterol as it is phospholipid, though, of course, it depends on the cell. Uh, but phospholipids kind of explain the actual structure of it a little bit better, so that's why we make you learn that. Uh, but it is more of a, like a one to one ratio, honestly. And the function of adding your cholesterols or whatever sterol you're using into the actual membrane is uh, it, it serves a couple purposes, but basically it makes it more structurally sound when you have adjustments in temperature. So if your phospholipids are really, really cold, so this is uh, thinking that, uh, assuming that there is no cholesterol there, okay? So maybe you don't have any fat in your diet or uh, your body is having a lot of trouble generating fat. Maybe you have some kind of a metabolic disorder or maybe you're anorexic or whatever. And it's, um, I'm not trying to downplay that, but like if you're not getting enough fats in your diet, and if you don't have enough nutrition in your diet, uh, your lipid bilayers are going to fail. And if your lipid bilayers fail, you die. Uh, and so that's one of the first things that can start to go. Uh, but it's what your body's going to sacrifice to make, too. Uh, so if you don't have cholesterol, if it gets really cold, you can imagine the, all the phospholipids, they stop vibrating as much because that's what cold is, right? And uh, it's the lack of vibration. And it gets really rigid and it can shatter because it's so cold. It's kind of frozen. Now, if it gets too hot as well, then they can sort of fall apart. And so what cholesterol does is it sort of bridges the gap between those two things. I have a graph in a second that's going to kind of show that a little bit better. I got this uh, from a, a paper. It's really good. You can go on there and uh, look this paper up. Um, the, they're going to uh, apply fluidity and flexibility to the phospholipid bilayers, okay? So it lets you pack them a little bit tighter and increases your strength. And your body's really warm, right? So uh, in humans and most mammals, we don't have to worry about getting too cold, right? Because we'll sacrifice uh, energy to maintain our body heat. Not all creatures do that, but we do. And so uh, we're generally dealing with warmth, right? And so what can happen if we're too hot and we don't have enough cholesterol is that it gets too fluid, your fossil lipids won't hold their shape. And so we're basically going to use our uh, cholesterols to sort of hold those, uh, act as the glue to hold the membranes together. And I have a picture here. I, I like this one. I know the quality is a little bit lower. Some of the uh, picture qualities for some of these just aren't great, but I, I like them. I don't know. It just, I like this one a lot because it really demonstrates how much cholesterol there is. The red ones are cholesterols. How much cholesterol there is per phospholipid. I mean, it's like a one-to-one, -one, if not higher ratio of cholesterol to phospholipid. So it's really, really interesting. I like this one too because it shows the receptors that are embedded uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about. But first, let's finish talking about this. The more the cholesterol you have, the tighter you can pack it and the stronger your membrane. Now, of course, there's a limit to that. You don't want, <laughs> you don't want too much cholesterol in your phospholipids, uh, hence why we're talking about, you know, actually being able to get rid of it. Um, but uh, <laughs> biophysicists study this kind of structure. And if you have cholesterol, it really evens out. So in blue is the cholesterol here. And so as your temperature changes, you can see uh, the fluctuations and the actual fluidity, okay? because you don't want your phospholipids to be too fluid, right? That would be heat, so it can be too fluid. But you don't want it to be too uh, stiff as well. So you want that nice evenness, and that's what cholesterol does. At different temperatures, it just kind of uh, uh, flattens out the curve, because that's what's going on with COVID right now. Uh, but it just kind of narrows, uh, it just makes it easier, okay? If you don't have cholesterol, you have these massive fluctuations, and it can really uh, cause some damage. Uh, so that's bad, you know, damaged phospholipid bias. Bad. Um, let's do an example. So uh, what kind of cells have a lot of these? So your neurons need a myelin sheath. So you may have heard about this if you've taken, like, an anatomy and physiology course. Uh, you hear about your Schwann cells. Uh, which actually wrap up your axons. That's when uh, you have the nodes of Ron VA, which is like the coolest term ever. Um, but basically, you have that action potential uh, between uh, positive and negative charge along your neuron, but you need to maintain that. And to, in order to do that, you have to have it nice and insulated, just like a, in a, a wire in your house or whatever. I'm looking at, <laughs> as if you guys can see me look at the outlet on my wall. Um, and so you need to make sure that you keep it nice and uh, insulated, nice and insulated. Um, and so that's what your myelin sheath's job is going to be. And the Schwann cells are really interesting. So they take their lipid bilayer, they look like a regular cell, and look at that, they're going to stretch out 
and make it's still a, a lipid bilayer. It's still two layers of cell, but it wraps around. So you end up with like two lipid bilayers because so like the rest of the cell is just like crushed into like this little area, and it's uh, really really cool. And it wraps around over and over and over again, and it just really insulates that, uh, which is really really cool. So insulation that is one of the big functions. So uh, I, a charge barrier is one of the membrane functions, but there are lots of other membrane functions that exist. Of course, it's a semi-permeable layer. You gotta separate stuff. If you have a cell, you need compartments. It's just like your house. You need to have separate compartments. You don't have your bathroom and your kitchen and your bedroom all in the same room if you can afford not to. I mean, of course, some people have that, uh, but if you can avoid it, you want to because you don't want where you poop to be right next to where you prep your food, right? Uh, and so you need some kind of separation and cells are the same way. So if I need to do different things, I need to have separation. So like your cells have a little trash can with lots of really powerful enzymes that can cut stuff up. Well, I don't want those right next to like my DNA or my ribosomes because they're gonna cut those up. And so we separate them. And that's one of the main jobs of membranes. Uh, and they also act as nice little scaffolds. So we can uh, attach things to them. We can stick proteins inside of them uh, and do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty fun. Uh, now, there are multiple models. Uh, the fluid mosaic model is the most commonly talked about. Um, if you take cell biology, uh, if you take it with me, then you will learn that there are other models, and we talk a lot, actually, about uh, membranes and membrane function, and so it's a kind of an extension of this actual uh, talk that I'm giving right now. But the fluid mosaic model is generally the, uh, the most accepted, but there's, uh, it's more complex than what it is. Uh, generally thought of. And so fluid mosaic just implies like, like these are, the way I see it is these are like giant chunks of ice or uh, like a, if this was like a, a pool and you threw uh, as many beach balls as you could fit in there, uh, the and then you have like a bigger, uh, like a, I don't know, a person or um, a giant inflatable thing. The inflatable thing can still move around the pool. It can kind of squeeze in between these beach balls, but you do have like some structure to it. So uh, the beach, beach balls can move, but they are a, a, a level of structure. And so that's basically the fluid mosaic models that things can move around. Uh, you can do all kinds of stuff to these proteins. Of course, you can glycosylate them, you can throw lipids on there, whatever. Uh, but the lipid bilayer itself is really, really cool. And it's moving, it's actively doing stuff. You can stick proteins in it. They can be integrated. They can be peripheral on the edges, though you do usually have some kind of integral portion uh, to it. Um, all kinds of stuff. I mean, every receptor is going to be integrated. Um, every transporter or channel protein, which I'm going to talk about those. Uh, wow, that quality is terrible. Okay, uh, it didn't look terrible earlier. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'll just shrink it down and pretend that it doesn't look terrible. Uh, but you can have all kinds of stuff. Uh, and classic biology exam questions are just asking like the different kinds of membranes and the different kinds of proteins functions in membranes? Um, are they going to act as a receptor? Are they going to act as a channel to let things in or put things back out? Uh, can they talk to other cells? Um, I mean, viruses use these, right? A virus is going to have a ligand or a ligand that's going to bind to a cell receptor and it'll let the virus in, uh, but that's all dependent on your phospholipid bilayer, or should we say cholesterol slash phospholipid bilayer? Uh, yeah, it's really, really important. As far as specifically what's happening, um, we need to talk about that. So uh, there's different kinds of diffusion, right? So phospholipid bilayers are semi-permeable. What does that mean? Well, some things can pass through and some things can't. So water is typically can just pass right through it. So it shouldn't just diffuse through. Uh, it's all about gradients, right? So if I have a bunch of something on one side and none of it on the other, it wants to get to the other side and I can take advantage of that. Uh, which when we talk about uh, like the electron transport chain, well, charged molecules tend not to be able to pass through phospholipid bilayers because they have that big hydrophobic region. Okay? So they're attracted to the hydrophilic regions where there's charges and they avoid the hydrophobic regions, which can be really, really big. And so we can put hydrogens on one side of a membrane and let them pass through and it acts as like a little water wheel and we can use that power. And so uh, that's, uh, so simple diffusion is just if it can pass through um, there's other molecules that can do that, uh, glucose being the other more common one, uh, but sometimes you want a bunch of it to come through, in which case maybe I want a bunch of water to come in, or maybe I want a bunch of glucose to come in, so I get a glucose transporter. And that acts like this, where it allows like a giant thing, it's not aquaporin, but it lets like a giant amount come through faster than just simple diffusion. 
Okay. Uh, you can facilitate the diffusion. Okay. So uh, you could have like, uh, in this case, we've got a non-specific transporter or you could have a specific transporter. I mean, cells are so full of variety. It's kind of awesome. Uh, but facilitated diffusion is just, I'm taking a protein channel and sticking it in the phospholipid bilayer. So that something can happen. Uh, that can be powered, it can be unpowered. Usually if you're powering it, that means that you want it to go against a gradient uh, as opposed to not. Um, turn this back down. Uh, now the phospholipid bilayer itself, um, we can, uh, I was talking about that. So uh, when I spend energy with a specific transporter, that's usually if I'm trying to go against a gradient. And that's where we see like in neurons, uh, when we have our sodium potassium pumps, to uh, put a bunch of sodium on one side and a bunch of potassium on the other, uh, but the actual amounts of charges are different. So you end up with a, a, a more positive side and a more negative side. And then when you allow them to quickly switch, then that acts as a conduction mechanism and it allows the transport of information, basically, uh, of which calcium is one of the very important molecules at the end of that transmission. Transport was the term. I. <laughs> Completely forgot. I don't know why. I'm just out of my mind, basically. Uh, if I'm going to spend ATP, then it's active transport. Now, there's a bunch of different kinds of this. You can dig real deep into it if you want to. I mean, of course, things are passive if they're just going from high to low, okay? Uh, but if I want to go against a gradient, then I got to spend some money, right? So if I want to pump water, water will just flow downhill, but if I want it to go uphill, I'm going to have to spend some energy. Uh, and there's lots of different ways you can do that. You can go from high to low. You can go from low to high. Sometimes you can use, like, um, a carrier medi mediated would be using something in conjunction. Uh, so like you allow something to go from high to low and that allows you to push something the other direction. Uh, but basically you're usually, if we're talking about active transport, you're usually depending on primary, which is using ATP to actually power your transporter. Your lipid bilayers are super dynamic. Now, not only can they act as scaffolding to, you know, put proteins in or whatever, uh, we can have a variety of ways of endocytic pathways or vesicle formation to actually uh, move things around. And so this gets talked about a lot, like phagocytosis, people talk about that a lot. Um, there are subcategories of all of these. Um, so uh, this is an entire field of study of how all the different proteins associated with forming, like the pseudopods, or the phagosomes, um, the vesicle formation, uh, there's like clathrin coated pits. Um, there's just so many different things uh, associated with this. Uh, if you take cell biology, we talk way more about this. Um, but suffice to say, your lipid bilayer is incredibly dynamic, which is really, really cool. And that sort of comes off of the endomembrane system. And so uh, I think one of the first lectures we had was talking about, uh, you know, the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus and what do they do in vesicles. And so those are all lipid bilayers. And so that's kind of uh, what I wanted to end on was just lipid bilayers are so important and they're so ubiquitous that we kind of uh, give them short shrift. I've never used that term before. Uh, they We just kind of forget about them, right? They're just the, the walls that hold us together. But uh, it's so easy to forget how important those walls actually are and the jobs that they serve, right? Um, and so they're really, really important. And so that's what I want you to take from that. In case you didn't think phospholipid bilayers and membranes and sterols and cholesterols and fatty acids were complicated enough. Uh, this very last thing I want to talk about is the idea of lipid wraps. So it's a subset of research that goes into like the actual structure of phospholipid bilayers. Uh, once again, if you take cell biology, we'll talk about this in more detail. Uh, but basically what they noticed was um, you could take all the lipid bilayers out of a cell and you could throw a detergent at it. So like soap, basically and there were regions that were detergent resistant. And so they took those and they were trying to figure out what is going on with these. And basically there were these lipid rafts. So they would be full of cholesterols and they'd be really, really dense. And that's where you would see these proteins actually get embedded. So it's not as simple of like, oh, I just threw the protein in there. You know, It's just sitting in there, it's stuck in there somewhere. Uh, where's this one? Yeah, it's just, oh, they're just kind of randomly in there. No, they're not. Uh, those fluid mosaics, uh, they're actually really complicated. We call those lipid rafts. And what's really, really cool is that you can isolate them and separate them out and actually find specific regions that are responsible for specific functions. So you could have like a nice signaling kinase pathway 
that's associated with one lipid raft, or you could have a secretion area. And so it's just one more level of organization to a cell where you can just see like, oh, okay, like cells aren't just these random smatterings of proteins embedded in a phospholipid bilayer, okay? They are much more complicated than that. And I want you to appreciate how complex a cell can actually be. Uh, just think about like all the mechanisms that are involved in putting all these proteins and making sure that this region has the right amount of sterols and it gets really complicated really fast and I just want you to appreciate that, which I think you do.